That Old Queer, Episode 4, Captain Moonlight. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which we gather. We are recording this on the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, and work has been done for this project on both Cubby Cubby and Jinnabara land. We pay our respects to their elders, both past, present and future. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Hello and welcome to That Old Queer, a queer history podcast. Each episode we'll be taking you through a queer person from history. Uh, my name is Anthony Basado. I, like every other episode, will be your host tonight. And joining me as always is Taylor Gale, my co-host. Who are we? We are just a couple of queers that your mother would have warned you about who is mm-hmm. sick of our history being overlooked, rewritten, destroyed or homogenised. Mm-hmm. How are you today, Taylor? I'm quite well, actually. Episode four, did you think we'd make it this far? No. <laughs> Confidence is overwhelming. No, it's great. We're, I think we're fine. Yeah. What have you been up to? I've been actually working on a couple of theatre projects. Oh, would I be involved in one of them? <laughs> Just maybe. Just maybe. It's not like you're supposed to be like my whole plot on it. Um. <laughs> um, currently working on, as you know, the creative development of um, a project that tells classical texts through the lens of a board game. Mm. And we're focusing on Shakespeare's The Tempest at the moment. Which is, you know, such an exciting text. It's, it lends itself so well to, like, a fantastic game that yeah. we're really looking forward to. Hopefully, hopefully this artistic development will lead to greater things about it, but yeah. we're not 100% sure. Are you ready to get started, though? Yes! So keen! So, as always, we start with the segment, Who They?! Who they? Who they? This is a segment where I give a random fact about the person we are exploring today to Taylor to read out, and then she has to guess who we are talking about. I don't think she's going to get it this year. This year? This this, year. This podcast, because I've made it a little bit more difficult. It's almost like a some sort of poetry. Okay. For the fact, but I would be interested to see um, if she gets it. So, here is your fact. Here's my fact. It's upside down. Okay. Son of a preacher man, turned preacher, turned bank robber, turned prisoner, turned bush ranger, turned gay icon. <laughs> Any idea who we're talking about? Bush ranger assumes Australian, and that's as far as I get. There's a lot of bank robbers, bush rangers, don't know many who fully identified as queer. Well, you're you're right. This is actually the first Australian we will be exploring on this podcast. So so good. Yay, Australia! Yay, yay! I actually thought you probably will know this one, or at least have heard his name. Mm-hmm. So I went a little harder with the uh, That's fair. the the fact to be a bit more vague because you you're such a Australian history buff. Yes. Um. So who we are exploring mm-hmm. today is Andrew George Scott, also known as Captain Moonlight. Oh, okay, yeah. The Bush Ranger. <laughs> yeah, should have guessed that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll start with, like we do every week as well, with uh, What in the Wiki? What in the Wiki is where I read the first paragraph of someone's Wikipedia page to give you sort of a brief overview of who they were as a person. Um, we know it's not an academic source, or so if you're using our podcast as research, go and look up other things. Don't quote the What in the Wiki segment of the no. show. But remember... Wikipedia does offer sources, which are better stepping stone into actually... Oh, I did it all the time at uni. Yeah, that's we use that a lot. You can always go to the Wikipedia page and then find the source and then go to that source and then find your information there. So are you ready for What in the Wiki? Yes. You're going to do a, a different song again this week? Oh, okay. What in the Wiki... Great. Don't have to worry about copyright music when you do that. (laughs) So, what in the wiki for Captain Moonlight? Andrew George Scott, baptised 5th of July 1842, died 20th of January 1880, also known as Captain Moonlight, though also referred to as Alexander Charles Scott and Captain Moonlight spelt L-I-G-H-T, where usually it's spelt M-O-O-N-L-I-T-E. Um, was an he was an Irish-born New Zealand immigrant to the colony of Victoria, a bush ranger there and in the colony of New South Wales, and eventually and current day Australian folk figure. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the whole paragraph. It's quite short. It's so short. Yeah. 
Isn't that always with Australian history? Yeah, though? yeah, it is. There's not. There's usually like small paragraphs compared to like massive paragraph for like a lot of places yeah. around the world. I, I copied it over and I sort of went, God, that needs to be mm-hmm. more there. Yeah. It was just like, it was so short. I'm like, I've got to do a whole segment on this, guys. What the fuck? <laughs> you couldn't have given me a little bit more. But yeah, that's that's what in the wiki. So what are your first thoughts on Captain Moon? I like? mean, the fact that, yeah. like, Australian history nerd, so Bush Ranger, so know who Captain Moonlight is. But the fact that he, I now know that he's a gay icon, I'm very keen to find out more. Yeah. I mean, even a little liberal with gay icon, I think yeah. icon well, status hasn't been given no. to him. Gay icon for me because I'm Australian and I'm like, yes, a gay Bush Ranger. Work, yeah. queen, work. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, between us, gay icon. But, like, to hear that he is gay is fantastic because obviously doing own research for different things and doing Australian history in school you obviously hear the name it's referenced in uh, other texts in terms of like poems or even movies sh- movies mm. and tv shows around Australia and around bush rangers but never obviously mentioned him being queer well I mean I say gay icon I think it's probably Again. Definitely, definitely queer somewhere is is yeah. my opinion on this. Yeah. Um. Never specifically stated. No. Gay, like so many people from history. So I'm guessing like the same sort of vibes that we get from um Sappho in terms of, or even more obscure. And like Walt Whitman that we explored, yeah. previously, it's it's very much that idea that it wasn't talked about openly. Mm. I think he probably talked about it more openly than yes. some others. That's fair. Um. But yeah, a little bit more. He he was born in Ireland, as I said, mm-hmm. son of Thomas Scott, who was an Anglican clergyman. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think about a Bush Ranger being a, a son of a preacher man? Actually, that's I mean, it's great, but it's very common. I feel feel like it's generally a lot of them were <laughs> like tied to the church and somehow, or like those sort of lot lot of Irish Bush Rangers. Like Irish born Australians, bush rangers. Yeah. Uh, f- my fa- <laughs> I mean, my family came over as horse thieves, so I feel like I can relate. And Irish family. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm Irish, but the same r- roots. Um, yeah, there's definitely, it's a very common theme in Australian history of that time. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that he didn't come straight to Australia. Mm. The whole family moved to New Zealand first in 1861. Um, with Scott intending to try his luck at the Otago gold fields. Yep. You know, gold mining was big over there as well as it was here in Australia. He was a part of the Maori Wars. I think we okay. shouldn't shy away from facts okay. that sort of are a bit icky about the people we were exploring. He did fight and signed up as an officer, um, fought a battle at Arakayu, I think I'm saying that right, where he was wounded in both legs. Mm-hmm. Um after a long convalescence, was accused of malingering and court-martialed. He gave his disquiet, disquiet um, so he was against and and talked about the fact that he was against the fact that women and children were being slaughtered during the siege mm-hmm. um, as the source of his objection to returning to service. Which, so, I mean, fighting in the war, but, like, points to... Go and the women and children are innocent in this. They shouldn't be slaughtered. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much credit we can give him no. to begin with about no. fighting in the Maori War. Yeah. It was a much more colonial time. Mm. So, you know, that was but the also, environment he was It's also in. depending on what he, like, who he's referring to in terms of the women and children. Yeah, that's very true as well. And it also could just all be a thing he made up because he didn't want to go back to war because he got hurt. That's fair. But, yeah, we're not going to try to shy away from those sort of facts about someone. Yeah. It's we don't agree with it, mm. the fact that the Maori people had a war fought against them for their land. Yeah. Um, As every country and civilization against colonizers. Yeah. But he, shortly after that, moved to Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, In Melbourne, he met a bishop, Charles Perry, Mm -hmm. and he was appointed as a lay reader. So he was a lay preacher man. So in the the fact Mm -hmm. I gave you, I said, you know, son of a preacher man turned preacher. He was a lay preacher, meaning he was given money by the church. He was paid by the church to go and preach, but he was never 
an official minister or bishop or anything yeah. like that. Um, he was a- appointed a la- uh, as lay reader at Barkus Marsh in Victoria. Barkus Marsh. Yeah, Barkus Marsh, thank you, with the intention of entering the Anglican priesthood on the completion of his service. Mm-hmm. He was then moved on to the mining town of Mount Egerton, Ergerton. Um, and that move made him angry. He went from a bit more of a rich and profitable um, town yeah. to, to a bit a very much more of a poor town. Mm-hmm. And sort of while he was out there, he turned to crime and where he committed yeah. his first crime yeah. and first called himself Captain Moonlight. Right. Um, I so I'll take you through. Did you know much about this? Well, I didn't know. He was quite um, started calling himself that quite early on in his criminal career. Yeah, so in on May 8th in 1869, he mm-hmm. disguised himself and forced the local bank agent, Ludwig Julius Wilhelm Brunn, which was... It's a great name. Yeah, why don't we do names like that anymore? <laughs> that's that's the real disservice we've done from history is short, precise names. Um, so the bank agent was actually his friend. Right. So Moonlight had befriended him yeah. over, over his time in the town. Mm. Um, Brune described the robbery as sort of like a, a, a man in a fantastic black crepe mask. Right. Um, forced him to sign um, a note. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll rephrase. Um, yeah, sorry. Let me rephrase. I'll reread the fact for everyone at home as well. Brune described being robbed by a fantastic black crepe masked figure who forced him to sign a note absolving him of any role in the crime. Um, so the note read, I hereby certify L.W. Brune has done everything within his power to withstand this intrusion and the taking of money which was done with firearms, um, which was sworn and signed by Captain Moonlight. So this is the first time he's referred to himself as Captain Moonlight. I wonder how long he went, if, like, how long it took him to come up with that name? Yeah, it's also like, at what point when you're committing a crime do you decide, yeah, I need, I need a non plume like an author and yeah. let's just make it really fancy. Because, like, if you think about, like, I don't know a lot about Bush Rangers and, like, the ones that come to mind are, like, Ned Kelly. They just went by their own name. Or, like, the Kelly gang. It's like, the, there was the Kelly brothers plus a few others. Yeah. But, like, they were the main notable. Yeah. I mean, I suppose signing Captain Moonlight makes you sound more ominous maybe and there was there was actually another captain moonlight um oh i cannot remember now it was in britain at some point he Mm. was he was a highwayman yeah so maybe there is that link there he did spell it differently i-t-e not uh i-g-h-t like the other captain moonlight was so i think we could have been created liberties going yeah we'll just take this name yeah we'll just we'll just Tweak it for an Australian Proper setting. Proper artist. Proper artist. <laughs> Stealing. <laughs> um, even though the note, Brune was blamed along with the schoolmaster, right. who was another friend, um, mm. because at the end of the day, at the end of the robbery, Moonlight sort of tied him up in the school schoolhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he was eventually blamed, even though he swore that it was Scott, who yeah. is Captain Moonlight. Yeah. So he swore it was him, but sort of never really came up very mm. shortly after that he quit his lay preaching job yeah um and uh shortly after that he went to maitland district mm-hmm. um where he was convicted on two charges of obtaining money by false pretenses mm-hmm. which he was sentenced to two jail terms of mm-hmm. which was uh 12 and 18 months a piece right um of these concurrent terms scott served 15 months at the expiration of which time he returned to Sydney, which were there he was then arrested for the bank robbery back in Egerton. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I love about this idea of him um, gaining money under false pretenses, yeah. in some of my research about him, it seems to be that he had a really good way of talking people out of their money. <laughs> like oh, a not, con man. Not, yeah, a bit of a con man. Not so much people, like hotels. Hotels yeah. would rack up bills for him sometimes where he'd be presented as this sort of, like, worldly person. He was good for the cash and, you know, he'd, he'd rack up a bill and then just rack off. Yeah. So, you know. Which is a still crime that happens today. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Um, 
so yeah, when he got back to Sydney in March of 1872, he was then arrested for the bank robbery and forwarded to Ballarat for examination and trial. Mm-hmm. Um, good old Ballarat. Good old Ballarat. He then escaped prison mm-hmm. with the help of a convict in the cell next to him. They <laughs> over, overpowered a warder and um, tied him up and uh, let a couple other prisoners out as well. Mm-hmm. They were all recaptured. Obviously. Obviously, because, you know. No sense of direction. I don't know. <laughs> Hope. Well, I feel like it's like perfect D and D jailbreak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They get out and then they just can't find their way out. Um, yeah. They yeah they were recaptured. Um, um, at his trial, he rejected um, lawyer mm-hmm. counsel and self exam. This is a fact I love about him. Okay, so this is such a random fact. Okay. When he was recaptured and he stood trial, yeah. he refused counsel, meaning no lawyer was present, no barrister or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And he had to self-examine himself as a witness, which he made and spread. He, he was able to spread the entire case over an additional eight days. <laughs> he just wasted time and I didn't have it. a barrister. I love it. Drama queen. He was such a drama queen. To be fair, to call yourself Captain Moonlight and to be a ba- uh, to be a bush ranger, I feel like you have to be a drama queen. Yeah, a little bit. I think I think so as well. Um, it didn't work. No. He he was still sentenced to mm-hmm. ten years, um, in Pe- Pent Ridge Prison, which is in Melbourne, mm-hmm. um, and he served two thirds of his sentence in prison. Mm-hmm. In prison is where. A bit of a love interest comes into the Ooh, saucy, saucy yeah. into the into the mix. This mm-hmm. is this is where sort of we do take the queer turn. We, we've sort of seen where he starts to become a bit of a bush ranger, mm-hmm. calls himself Moonlight, but isn't technically a bush ranger yet yeah. by by mm-hmm. the the stock standards of what a bush ranger is. Yeah. Um, but in prison he meets James Nesbit. Mm. Um, so that's where this story really takes a fun turn. Um, Nesbitt is believed by many to have been Moonlight's partner, mm-hmm. gay lover, smoochie boy, whatever we want to call them. Yeah. Um, Where did smoochie boy go? I don't know. It just popped into my head. Okay. Um, yeah, while in prison, Nesbitt was punished and disciplined for taking tea to prisoner Scott. Ooh. So I like to think that as a little little tea date, a little yeah. a little sip in the tea in prison. Yeah. Maybe sip in the tea and drop in some tea. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of good queens in prison. Yes. Um and yeah, once they both got out of prison they shared a rundown house as well. Mm-hmm. Um Scott earned a few pounds once they got out of prison talking about prisoner reform. Right. Um but a lot of places refused to book him due to the fact that he was um, a convict at this yeah. point. And it also didn't help that a lot of the local papers were blaming him for a lot of crimes that were happening in the area, probably falsely. Mm. Well, that was the case. If you like, a lot of people, if there was an, if they knew a notable figure was in the area, something went wrong, they're like, oh, just blame it on them. Like, there's a song about the Kelly gang. It's called Blame It on the Kellys. Mm. It's like, oh, someone did this. Blame it on the Kellys. Like, someone shot this goat. Blame it on the Kellys. Like, that's a common thing in yeah. our history. Yeah, so he got out of prison and by all accounts he was really trying to make it work. Mm. Wasn't trying to go back to crime in any sense. Which is good. He tried to work through these talks. He tried to find work. Um... But because the local papers are going to so many unsolved crimes, yeah. as well as police going and warning potential employers of who he was, yeah, um, it sort of made it very hard, yeah, um, to 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 find work, and the police kept dragging him in constantly and accusing him of sort of these big preposterous allegations that yeah. were never really linked to him. That starts, like, limiting your choices then. Yeah. Like, if they're, like, shutting every door in, in your face, it's like, well, you sort of have to turn back to crime. Yeah, and that's sort of what happened to a degree. Mm. So Scott, who was Moonlight, I'll keep saying that. I'll, I'll either say Scott or Moonlight about him. But yeah. Moonlight and Nesbitt, his, his, his man, um, decided to leave Melbourne mm-hmm. and started walking up to New South Wales, looking for work in small towns. Um, 
yeah, just sort of like walking along, trying to find work, and they were eventually joined by a small group of young men. Mm-hmm. Um, they would be Thomas Rogan, who was 21, mm-hmm. Thomas Williams, 19, Graham Bennett, 18, and the youngest of the bunch is Augustus Wernick, who was 15. Ooh, that's pretty young. He was very young at the time. Um, and by all accounts, Moonlight held some sort of power over these boys. He was 34 at the time. Yeah. So he was quite a bit older than him, and apparently they all basked in admiration of him. Fanboys. They were a bit of a fanboy, according to most accounts, that they they really enjoyed and really sort of admired him. Well, I mean, if we've already talked about him being, like, being able to talk people about money or, like, rack up these bills and, like, being a worldly man, I'd say that he's, like, very charismatic. Mm. And so these young people who mostly didn't have many prospects sort of just latched onto this charismatic figure and it almost sounds like they could worship him as a god. I think a little bit. I think there was a bit of idol worshipping about yeah. him. Um, they sort of... Uh, accounts from this time don't really say if they did crimes. They may have done petty crimes at this time. Yeah. But Scott later wrote that as long as our money lasted... We bought bread, and when our money was gone, we sold our clothes and bought bread with what we obtained for them. Mm -hmm. We tried to get work, but could not, and we fasted day after day. So there is this idea that they were still even wandering out of Melbourne trying not to do crime. Yeah. I think they really tried not to go back to prison as well. Yeah. I mean, think at the time, prisons were not great. Prisons are still not great. Yeah, but... (laughs) Like, the fact that tea is a thing that it's hilarious in terms of, like, seeing a lot of these colonial prisons and around the time, like, conditions were not great. Um, no. So I would understand why they're trying not to go back there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they didn't, um, but they didn't really start bush ranging until they sort of hit, hit um, Mansfield in Victoria. Mm-hmm. And and what's interesting is this was actually a sort of Cali gang area of operations yeah. and they overlapped. They were in the same time um, and they were frequently mistaken for the Cali gang. And I think they sort of took, it's sort of reported that they took this as an opportunity to sort of receive food and, and, yeah. and seize guns and ammunition from I homesteads. I mean, to be fair, in that situation, would do the same. You're walking into town, you're bunch of blokes they're like oh the kelly gang's here like don't upset them they're gonna someone's gonna die his food yeah cool yeah we're the kelly gang yeah yeah there there are reports well sorry there's one report from this inspecting superintendent of police john sadlier who who made a highly improbable claim that scott had sent word to ned kelly Sort of that, mm. sort of sent word out to Ned Kelly asking to join forces, for which Kelly apparently sent, you know, words back threatening Moonlight that if his band approached them, they'd be killed. But there's sort of no evidence yeah, to suggest. I, I doubt. I think that's just a fan, like, fanfare in terms of and spreading rumours and actually trying to get that to happen so they just kill each other off. Yeah. But. Um, but other reports have them that stating that the group had been living on damper and koala meat yeah um and then no food when they approached wanta badgery station near gundai um gundagai gundagai yeah um which was a property that was known to ha- be hospitable to a lot of people that they mm-hmm. that you could you know find a, a food there find water there find a bit of respite there that they'll give you a fee for a little work mm. um and this is sort of like where they really sort of became bush rangers. Yeah. They only have one really one big thing that they did that sort of like cements them as bush rangers, and it's mm-hmm. this what happened here um, at Wantamadjuri Station. Mm-hmm. So it was known as this place where you could get a feed for a bit of work, a place to stay, but it had recently changed hands. Right. So the people who had owned it had, you know, sold it, and they would find no sympathy there anymore. Yeah. Um, Scott later wrote that misery and hunger produced despair and in one wild hour we proved how much the wretched dared. And he was a bit of a poet. Yeah. Um, so they, when they got there and they couldn't get through, they retreated into the, into the bush, mm-hmm. returned with guns in hand, 
transforming at last into sort of like this persona that yeah. was Captain Moonlight. He finally became Captain Moonlight yeah. and came back and, and and sort of took the homestead. Yeah. For what which, it was. Which is very taking a homestead is a very common thing with our bush rangers. Like even look at um Mad Dog and like well that's how he was captured is he took a homestead and then the nanny managed to sneak out. Yeah, and this is how they were captured as well. Yeah. Eventually. They um they got nothing of value from the homestead, but they no. were they had got food and they got drinks. Um but sort of it's reported that Moonlight wanted a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So he went to the, the hotel close by the Australian Art Hotel and detained everyone there and forced them back to want a badgery station. Yeah. Um where it all almost seemed that he was more concerned with, with sort of playing as a gentlemanly host than robbing them for anything. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, wanted more to play host than to, to escape even. Yeah, he's like, no, no, I've got these people, they're my guests, let, let me work. Yeah, it sort of, it sort of turned out like that. Mm-hmm. Um, troopers eventually arrived, as they always do, yeah. and there was a gunfight. Yeah. Um, in the gunfight, one of his band died, and mm-hmm. of course yeah. it was Paul Love. Uh, Augustus, yeah, the youngest who, one. The, who was 15 at the time. Apparently, when he was shot and he was wounded and dying, he was screaming out that he was only 15. I'm only 15. Apparently, he cried. Um, and Nesbitt also died from his lover. Ooh. He was shot in the head. Um, a journalist at the time described... Um, sorry, a journalist at the time described how, as Nesbitt dies, Scott wept over him like a child laid his head upon his breast and kissed him passionately. So his lover had died. Yeah. Um, it's kind of sad. Yeah. Apparently, by all, all accounts, it was when Nesbitt died, he s- broke almost mm. in that very moment. Um, unfortunately, at the same time as this is happening, a senior constable, mm. and Edward Webb Bowen had taken the bullet to the spine and would subsequently die, which sealed all their fates pretty much. To be hung? Um, not all of them. Okay. Um, Johns and Bennett. Mm-hmm. So Johns was... Um, sorry, Bennett received an eventual commutation on the grounds of his youth. Mm-hmm. Scott and Rogan. Mm-hmm. Um, who hadn't even fired a shot, that yeah. was Rogan, um, walked to the gallows wow. on the 20th of January, 1880, and were buried at Sydney Rookwood Cemetery. So Moonlight was condemned and hanged. While yeah. awaiting his hanging, Scott wrote a series of death cell letters, which we'll get into a bit. What's very interesting about this is, yes, the truth of being shot sort of sealed the fate, mm-hmm. but also what sealed their fate is that they were operating at the same time as the Kelly gang. Yeah. they They were very much given very harsh sentences because they were members of the Kelly gang. Although they were operating at the same time as the Kelly gang and they hadn't got the Kelly gang yet. Yeah. And I feel like there's always that you're doing this, but they're the ones we want. So we're going to punish you to scare them. Yeah. Or take out our anger out on you. Yeah. Which they definitely did. Yeah. Like, cause considering like what they did, is like not that they didn't kill anyone. They didn't besides kill that one police officer who eventually died from being shot. Yeah. Um, it's kind of sad though that um. That, that Rogan got killed. Yeah. By all accounts, he hid under a table while oh, the gunfight happened and us. didn't fire uh, any shots. So it's kind of yeah. Um, that's, that's a bit shitty. But you know you're part of a, a bush can't... ranger gang. Yeah. Um, as I said, Moonlight was condemned and to be hung. While in prison, he wrote a series of death cell letters, which are sort of like the crux of where we really sort of get this idea of them being a bit more than friends in yeah. in a more of a documented form. Um, to Nesbitt's mother, Moonlight wrote, and I'll read the whole letter because it's okay. it's quite beautiful. So from Darlinghurst Jail, 19th of January, 1880, from prisoner Andrew G. Scott, alias Moonlight. My dearest Mrs. Nesbitt. To the mother of Jim, no colder addressed would be true. My heart to you is the same as to my own dearest mother. 
Um, Jim's sister are my sisters, his friends my friends. His hopes were my hopes, his grave will be my resting place. And I trust I may be worthy to be with him when we shall all meet to part no more. When, when an all-seeing God who can read all hearts will be the judge. Be long before I am with him in his grave, Mrs Nesbitt, mother of my Jim, may the great God enable you to bear the great loss you have suffered. I send you some of his hair and will try to send you anything else of his I can get. Give the love of a brother to dearest Jim's sisters and to his father. Farewell, my dearest Mrs Nesbitt. I am ever to you a loving son in spirit, A.G. Scott. It's so he loved Nesbitt. Yeah. Um, and this is really where he, he, he states the fact that he wants to be buried with Nesbitt as well, which is sort of like historically this thing that we see a little bit with queer couples. Oh, actually, speaking, Achilles and Patroclus were the same. Yeah. In, in From the Iliad. Yeah. Achilles wanted his ashes mixed with Patroclus's, this idea of them being buried together. Mm. Um, in another letter... Again, he stated to be buried beside my beloved James Nesbitt, the man with whom I united by every tie which could bind human friendship. We were one in hopes, in heart and soul, and this unity lasted until he died in my arms. Yeah. So this is why I sort of, like, I look at this and sort of go, you know, it's a bit more than just friendship. Oh, yeah. There's, like, that letter itself is just, like, heartbreaking. (laughs) It really is. It's, there is, his, his writing was actually really beautiful. Mm. Um, he was known as a bit of a poet. He did like to write. Yeah. Um, I thought that, I think that adds to him being quite charismatic, just by nature. Yeah. He was very poetic. And his way with words and. Um, yeah. And, and to talk like that about another man, mm. it doesn't really feel. No. To talk like that, like, as another human doesn't feel to be on a friendship level. No. Like, I I adore you and you're one of my closest friends. But when you die, I'm not going to be like, bury me with her. Yeah, no. Like, you you won't write that to my mother. (laughs) No. I would not write that to your mother. No. Um, In another letter, he actually used um, a a, a quote uh, in another... With a plea to, in another letter with a plea about his burial, mm. he he had a quotation from um, a Felicia Herman's poem entitled right. "The Lady of Provence," which was a, a poem which was about a woman's feelings to her dead lover. Right. So it goes, "Now call me hence, by thy side to be, the world thou least has no place for me. Give me my home on the noble heart." Well, have we loved, let us both depart. So he loved Nesbitt sort of with yeah. all his heart. It was his it was his last wish to be buried with Nesbitt. That yeah. was like his whole thing. Bury me with James Nesbitt. Yeah. Um he was eventually hung on the twentieth of January, eighteen eighty, and he went to the gallows wearing a ring of Nesbitt's hair tied around his finger. A lock of Nesbitt's hair he had with him when he died. Um, Unfortunately, his final request to be buried with Nesbitt was denied and he was buried at Rockwood Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So, thoughts on Captain Moonlight, the gay bushranger of Australia? I mean, you get, like, charismatic dude. You can see why these young men who, like, I assume... I'm just assuming I have no prospects. That's why they're traveling with him. We're like enthralled and we're like, yeah, we're going to go with this man. He's going to lead us to a better life. I don't know. And had it's very clear that he felt so strongly for James mm. that like, that would have cr- like, would have crushed him, his death to, and to die in his art. Like, I can't even imagine that. No. I've like, Neither has it felt that strongly about someone. So, so. <laughs> it's it's interesting because I've done research on um, Patroclus and Achilles, which will probably eventually be an episode on this as well. So I won't yeah. go too far into it. But people try to to deny 
some of these writings about both of them as this mm. idea of oh but they were they were just really good friends and this friendship that was born in the crucible of hardship and i'm just sort of like the way they're writing to any queer person yeah is so clearly more than just mate yeah. or you know? like and even it's different to being like brothers at arms and sort of thing like it's very clearly there is love and like absolute admiration yeah and like he obviously adored james he did <laughs> yeah so to me it it's gay. <laughs> it's gay it's gay what what do you think about the fact that he was he wasn't buried with nesbitt that's just really sad yeah but i mean like obviously at the time you're also looking at Obviously, that being queer, obviously not. Um, and he was a bush ranger, so his request wouldn't have been met most likely anyway. Yeah. Um, like you look at Ned Kelly's head was like put on the yeah. guy's desk as a trophy. Oof. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so. I, I wish they did, and I wish we like they'd done now. Or like yeah, to have have the final wish met. Met. Well, I've got some good news. Yeah. I'll I'll read you this from the Canberra Times. Okay. It was the last wish of Captain Moon. It was entitled "The Last Wish of Captain Moonlight Granted." Sydney. The last wish of Australian bush ranger Captain Moonlight was granted 115 years after his death. The remains of the bush ranger, whose real name was Andrew George Scott was reburied in the southwestern New South Wales town of Gundagai with his two fellow bush rangers. Moonlight gained notoriety for a siege of a, a, a Gundagai property in 1879. His comrade, James Nesbitt and August Weinrich, died in the final shootout, and Scott was hanged in 1880 for shooting a police officer. Moonlight's final wish was to, that he would be buried alongside his friends in Gundagai. However, they were public opposition to this, and he remains were put in an unmarked grave in Sydney Rock Cemetery. So he was eventually, mm-hmm. uh, 115 years later. So he died 1880. So that is, um, just calculated. <laughs> no, we can do the math. 1880, 100 is 1980. Mm-hmm. An extra 15 years is 95. Okay. So he was reburied in 1995. I do find it funny that all, all sort of the accounts of him being reburied, though, sort of mm-hmm. mention both, both the of friends. Them. Both, both Je- James Nesbitt and, and Aug- Augustus. And the comrades. Yeah, the language is very much like, oh, the chummy chums. He, he wanted to be buried with his friends, so his now... Bros. Yeah, and, and I love a Bush Rangers we've done it, but in all his writings, it wasn't to be buried with Augustus. No, it was to be buried with James. Yeah, to almost be buried in the same grave, which I don't think actually technically mm. happened. No. But they were buried together eventually. Mm. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. And, and like, there has been a lot more research and a lot more discussion around the fact that he's been reburied with a loved one now. Yeah. Um, but even, it's, it's, it's funny, that there's a politician from around Gundagai and I was reading a, an article. Mm. And this this lady was huge in getting him moved. Yeah. And even she was like, oh, no, they're just mates. I think they were mates. People can read into it, but they were mates. And I'm there going, no. But that, but that might not even be her view publicly. Like, that might, might be her view publicly, but that might not be her private view on it. I think that was her view on it. Yeah. And, and a lot of people just sort of go, oh, they were just friends. But to write like that about someone... Yeah. Even if you are so extremely hurt by their passing, um, but yeah, at least they were buried together. And there's some there's a, there's some really great stuff out there about them now. If you want to go do your own research, which I encourage people to always do. I've got a book here. Yeah, yeah, I've been reading a book about them, and there's another one that just recently came out as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, Captain Moonlight and James Nesbitt, I think, are unsung queer icons of Australia. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I'm glad they were finally buried. I just kind of wish that even when they were reburied, it was... It's it's one of those things where we now look at history. It's like, they did the right thing, but do they do it for the reason that yeah. 
we would hope them to do it. It was yeah. to honour a bush ranger, not to honour the last wills of someone to be buried with the love of their life. Yeah. It's this idea that even in 95, they would honour someone as a criminal, but not as a, yeah. a queer man. Yeah. Which is... I think we got to take the win for the what it is. <laughs> <laughs> really? Like, obviously... I wasn't born then, so I can't even... Like, you weren't born in 95? No. Oh, I'm so old. No, I mean, seven. I was, only, I was only three. You were so. only three. But yeah, I th- yeah, I guess you're right. We could take it as a win that they finally actually yeah. um, got buried together, which is lovely. Mm. But just some of the way he wrote. Oh, I feel oh. like we need to go visit his grave. Yeah, we should do a road trip. Yeah. Queer road trip. <laughs> yeah. Would people be interested in that? A, 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 a queer road trip of Australia where we get on the road and we just find the gay places of <laughs> Australia? <laughs> yes. I know I'm interested. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. I mean, there's a lot of probably sad stories as well we'd go through, but. Yeah. Um, oh. Taylor doesn't know this. Um, but as you guys know, each week we have mm. an artistic response from a queer artist. I'm not scared. But this week is a bit of a surprise. Um, as it hasn't actually been done yet for us to insert into it. Something that none of you will know, probably, is that Ms. Taylor Gale here was raised with some of Australia's best bush poets being performed in her backyard. Yep. Um, so I thought it was only appropriate for a bush ranger that we would have a bush poem done so this is me throwing down a challenge to her to write one um don't worry you won't have to wait because we're probably going to insert it through the magic of editing um but she's going to go away and write one and it will be right here it was moonlight and his gym that met in pentridge prison an unlikely place for love but it bloomed over blooming cups of tender tea An extra day added to Jim's sentence was simply another day together. Gone were days dreaming of just freedom, but days of stolen looks, laugh and lust. A bond formed in shackles, a bond for a free future. For in prison or not, together is all they wanted. It was Moonlight and his Jim that settled in a house. A house, a home, built on the hope of honesty, honest jobs, honest money, honest life. But gossip spread quickly. Around town it reached, the strangling grasp of jail was firm around their necks, no matter where they sought. Honesty was not for them. So, with a couple of lads they met along the way, they set out on their own for new beginnings and new horizons. It was Moonlight and his gym that made their way north. They ate bread while the money last and sold their clothes when it ran out, fasting day after day. Something had to be done if they wished to survive, for the voice of hunger overcomes the voice of reason. It was Moonlight and his gym with troopers on their backs, passing through Kelly Gang country. They used that to their advantage. They took what they wanted from homesteads that they passed, but stolen food didn't last long. Neither did damper and koala meat. There was talk of a station that offered food for work. It was there they sought to try their luck. It was Moonlight and his gym that made their way to Wantabadgery Station, but were met with a cold return, a slam door and no welcome. Misery and hunger produced despair, and in one wild hour they proved how much the wretched dared. They returned with guns and took the homestead, taking only food and drink. However, Moonlight wanted more. It was Moonlight and his gym that arrived at the Australian Art Hotel, detaining everyone and forcing them back to the station. It was there Moonlight played the gentlemanly host, not bothering to escape. Now truly bushrangers, now truly legends. It was Moonlight and his gym that had troopers at the door, guns firing from both sides, cries ran out. Augustus was shot, but the guns kept firing, and then Jim was shot, and Moonlight's world seemed to stop. It was Moonlight that held his gym 
as he took his final breath, kissing him passionately, holding him close, lying his head on his chest. Weeping like a child, grief and despair. It was moonlight alone that fired once more. Down his love and his friend, he hid his mark. The death of the trooper was nothing compared to the pain he felt. His actions would forfeit his life. In Sydney, he would face it. It was moonlight alone in a cell that wrote before his doom, letters full of love, full of Jim. A man he was united by every tie that would bind them. One in hopes, in heart and soul. I wish to be bound once more in their graves. It was Moonlight and his friend Thomas that walked one last time. They faced the noose together. Jim's hair wedlocked around his finger. Moonlight took his death in stride. The hope of seeing his love again gave him peace of mind, but his request to be buried with his Jim denied, and their graves sat apart. It was Moonlight that lay alone. A century had passed his wishes not forgotten, and in January 1995, Moonlight and his Jim were buried together at last. Wow, <laughs> that was that was brilliant. Thank you, seeming I haven't done it yet. I was, I was acting for the camera. Just was, it was, it was, uh, yeah, we haven't seen it, guys. Um, but you guys will probably see it shortly after we see it for the first time as well, so... Leave a comment in the comment section. Yeah. Is that the way to rephrase that? Leave a comment to let us know how Taylor went. Uh, any final thoughts on Captain Moonlight before we leave? I mean, we have a gay bush ranger. I know. It's so good. <laughs> Don't you just love it? A gay bush ranger. It just even sounds fantastic. I want, like, I know obviously Captain Moonlight didn't do a lot in terms of being, like, a fantastic story and stuff like that. But it's just, no. I want something that's, like, even if it's just another book called The Gay Bush Ranger. Yeah, I he was a looker as well. I'm going to show Taylor a, a picture, and we'll probably put one up on screen for yeah. the for the um, YouTube watchers. Mm -hmm. But this was him. I mean, it's, it's got a very piercing look. His eyes are a little crazy. This isn't a great picture. We'll put... Probably a better picture than I've got here. Yeah. But yeah, a gay bush ranger. I'd love to see more gay yeah. Australian history. I think I think really I want to do see if I can find some more mm. um queer Australian history. Yeah, absolutely. To explore. I mean we have such a we have a, a short history for colonization, but we've got such a long history in this country with our First Nations people mm. that It'd be interesting to see their perspective on it as well, and maybe, maybe one day we'll have a guest in to to explore that from their perspective to teach us about their history with queer figures and queer Absolutely culture. Love that. But even even since colonization, who 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 do we need to know? If you guys know anyone, let us know as well. Any Australian figures that we definitely should have on and cover and cover. Um, I feel like we need to go on like a road trip. That'd be so fun. Like a a, a, a a big queer, a big gay slash queer road trip. Yeah. That just takes us to, to all the to the major hotspots. Mm. I mean, there'd probably be a lot of sad things as well. Yeah, I feel like it's gonna be a very sad podcast, a very sad like series. Yeah, like you could explore the hot. Oh god, I, I love that the first thing that pops into my head is like, the the murders of gay men at Bondi. <laughs> but that's like, oh yeah, queer history in Australia, the murders at Bondi. <laughs> And then Mardi Gras, the first Mardi Gras in the world. Yeah. So figures from there we could probably explore as well. I mean, it's a bit more recent than anything we've explored so far, but yeah. they are just as important in mm. our history as queer people and and have actually been able to lend their voices and identify themselves mm. a lot more than anyone else we've explored. Yeah. So let us know if you'd like us to explore um, that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, finally, like we always would, we like to thank... Nissa Ray for lending us her studio today. She's a brilliant Sunshine Coast based singer songwriter. Um, she very generously has lent us her space for these first four episodes. 
uh, maybe more going forward. Um, but please go give her some love. Her stuff is absolutely brilliant. Um, I believe you can find her on Spotify as well. That's where yeah. I listen to her, Spotify. Yeah. Um, and she has socials as well, which will be linked down below if you're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, we would also like to acknowledge and thank the Sunshine Coast Regional Council and Arts Queensland for their support in this project through the Regional Arts Development Fund. They very generously gave us a bit of money to get off the, get off the ground and start this podcast up, so we'd like to thank them. They do a great job supporting regional arts and arts workers throughout Queensland. Mm. That is everything. Thank you for joining us again. This is episode five. Uh, oh, sorry, four, episode four. four. Um, we'll probably be taking a small break now before the next episode. We've sort of decided to put these out in, in lots of about four to five episodes just so it gives me time to do the research properly and, and yeah. to give everyone a proper moment that they deserve. And it also gives us a little bit of, of relief in between filming sessions. Yeah. Um, especially because going forward we won't have an influx of cash to support this. Um, but, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank and you. we will see you soon with another episode of That Old Queer. Um, thank you and goodbye. Bye. Funding was provided for this project through the Regional Arts Development Fund. The Regional Arts Development Fund is a partnership between the Queensland Government and the Sunshine Coast Council to support local arts and culture in regional Queensland. We would like to thank them for their support in the delivery of that old queer podcast. <laughs>